Welcome to Behavior Grooves, the podcast that explores stories, science, and secrets from the world's brightest thought leaders for the curious at heart. I'm Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We like to explore human behavior that will improve your relationships, your well-being, your organization by helping you find your groove. From best-selling authors to researchers, you will learn insights from the sharpest minds in behavioral sciences, especially from psychology, economics, and neuroscience. Well, Tim, we are continuing our series centered around ways in which our minds believe all sorts of things, from conspiracy theories to, well, just good old-fashioned bad ideas. And that's what we wanted to talk to our guest in this episode. Yeah, good point, Kurt. On top of the fact that his new book, Mental Immunity, just came out, Andy Norman's been trying to help people think better for many years. He's a philosophy professor at one of our favorite institutions, Carnegie Mellon University, and has authored dozens of peer-reviewed papers on moral philosophy. And he's a philosopher who, like William James, is equally interested in the psychological aspects of our thought processes. Andy keeps our month-long series on conspiracy thinking going with some insightful comments on how our partisanship impacts the way we actually think about the world and its problems. He does all of this under the analogy of healthy brains require some degree of immunity from bad ideas. And he's not afraid to call it the fact that not everything is relative, Tim. Yeah, Not everything. Yeah, I I loved it when he asked us to imagine a world where we're inoculated against bad ideas. Now, wouldn't that be a wonderful, wonderful world? Wouldn't it be great if our culture wars didn't make it so hard to get at real truths? Ah, wow. Yeah, dream on, buddy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but sometimes it's nice to dream, Tim. Nice. It's nice to dream. All right. And and thinking about dreaming, here's a dream that can actually come true for people. All right. We are having a very, very special Black Friday sale for our unique and absolutely wonderful new book and workbook, Leading Human. This is your opportunity to get the groundbreaking insights into building a human-centered workplace that will help attract, engage, and retain employees in your workplace. And now, If you order it on Black Friday, you will have the biggest discount that we will ever have on this. So go out to www.behavioralgrooves.com under products and order your copy of Leading Human on Black Friday and enjoy that deal and make your employee dreams come true. You like how I worked the dreams part into that, Tim? Was that I cool love or that. that. That was great. Yeah, I'm dreaming about it. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Well, dream on, man. You can actually, <laughs> dreams can come true in this type. Here we go. Okay. All right. With that out of the way, we want to invite you to sit back with a vaccination cocktail that will prevent you from all sorts of bad ideas and enjoy our conversation with Andy Norman. Andy Norman, welcome to Behavioral Grooves. Thank you, Tim. Nice to be here. We are excited to have you. Yeah, it's such a it's such a treat. We really loved mental immunity, and we're excited to talk about it. But as you know, we get started with a speed round. So, Kurt, would you like to get started? Sure. So, big, big question, Andy. Yeah. Prefer coffee or tea? Uh, coffee, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Not a hesitation there. We like that. All right. Every, every day, yes. So which philosopher in all of history would you prefer to have dinner with? Wow. Fascinating. Well, I certainly had my uh, Wittgenstein phase. Wittgenstein, the Vienna, Viennese (laughs) philosopher who contributed so much to logic and our understanding of language. But uh, actually, I think it would be Socrates himself. Yeah. I'm just fascinated by the Socratic method and... um, try to build on the wisdom implicit in Socrates' approach to idea testing, uh, both in the book and in the way I deal with everybody every day. Oh, I Fantastic. couldn't agree more. Like, wouldn't it just be amazing to actually have a, a conversation with the guy that created the Socratic method? <laughs> and, and of course, w- and would, would the relevant question to him be coffee, tea, or hemlock? <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> Definitely. All right. Coffee to your hemlock. Like, that might be the name of this episode. Here we go. Um, <laughs> I think we, we, we might have that. All right. Andy, in your ideal vacation, would that be one that had a fixed itinerary or would it be one that had no itinerary at all? Ah, yes. My wife and I have, have been back and forth on this. We've oh. been experimenting with both kinds and we've settled on a mix of the two. We <laughs> have a little bit of structure combined with uh, a fair amount of uh, just flex time. And uh, we find that works well for us. Oh, I love and- that. This the we could have more conversation on that easily because you know, well, were you the, were you the one who pushed for the flex time or was it your wife that pushed for the flex time that's that's the important question <laughs> um, we never found ourselves on opposite sides i think it was more a matter of just both trying to f- to learn about ourselves it was mutually stumbling towards a happy so. are you are are you avid travelers do you do you like to travel or is it only when necessary so Heidi, my wife, is is uh, always been a big travel fan, and she's actually taught me to like travel. I, I was kind of an anxious kid who, when I wasn't around surrounding, you know, familiar surroundings, I, I I kind of feel like out of my comfort zone. But she's actually taught me that uh, taught me to enjoy travel. Oh, fantastic! Interesting. That that's terrific. Okay, we are blazing through the speed round here, <laughs> and our last our last question is. Maybe this this could be even simpler than the vacation question. Are we experiencing an epidemic of unreason? Uh, you'll get a short answer on this one too. Ab- absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, this this has been my my passion. I've been trying to study why outbreaks of unreason happen. I've been doing that for about 30, 35 years. And I think there's some really interesting new answers out there to that question that can help us combat what I call epidemics of unreason. So in fact, I actually think that the concepts of epidemiology are apply to the spread of not just disinformation, but, but uh, unhinged modes of thinking. Well, explain that because I think that's a really interesting hypothesis that you can take this viral element of, of that. And so what are you thinking about in, when you're thinking about that? Yeah, so let's start high level. Um, I mean, we've all watched memes spread virally across mm-hmm. the internet in recent years. And that, I think, underscores a, a deep truth about us and our minds, namely that information can propagate in ways that don't benefit its hosts. <laughs> mm. So um, in the same way that a, a parasite requires a host, I think that bad ideas require hosts and that our minds are the are effectively the hosts of mind parasites. So you can actually reconceptualize bad ideas as mind parasites. Mm. And you start to see all kinds of interesting things about why things go wrong for humanity. <laughs> um, and you also start to see ways to fix those things so that we can get things to go right more often. So it's, yeah, this is, this is uh, great to bring this large scale architecture to into view but can you break it down just a bit tell us more about sort of the immunity issues yeah so traditionally we've thought about uh, immunity to bad ideas in terms with the concept of critical thinking mm-hmm. so the the basic the traditional approach to this problem is we have critical thinking skills so we're not susceptible to epidemics of bad ideas, but they don't. And so we just need to do be- a better job of teaching them how to think critically. Kind of so like every- kind of like this whole bootstrapping thing of, you know, if you just really put your, your mind to it, you could overcome anything sort of thing. Yeah. And we imagine that critical thinking is a, is a purely conscious process that we can control by examining arguments and throwing out the conclusions that, that don't withstand scrutiny. There's a lot of truth to that. The problem is that the whole approach to conceptualizing the problem is very, very limited. And if you go, uh, for 30 years, I actually taught critical thinking. And if you look at the basic textbooks and approaches to critical thinking that prevail in higher education now, they're very crude. There's so much more we, we could be doing to inoculate minds against viral nonsense. And the traditional tools being dispensed in university critical thinking courses simply aren't up to the challenge of protecting our minds in a hyper-connected, internet-connected world. 
So what are some of those things that we can do? And actually, you've written a book on this, Mental Immunity. So that, I think, is is one of the pieces. It's a great book for all of our listeners. We'll have, we'll have links to it in the show notes. Um, so definitely go check that out. But what what can we do to improve that immunity then? Yeah, I mean, great question, right? And and so I, I'll, I'll detail some very concrete steps that all of your listeners can take to strengthen their own mind's immune systems. Um, but I think it helps to actually spend a little time on on kind of the the framework that this new way of thinking about it offers. Because if you can adopt that framework, you'll start to see the things that need doing all on your own. So, so here's the basic idea. Bad ideas can be thought of as mind parasites. They mm-hmm. often behave like mind parasites. Second, our minds actually have immune systems. In other words, we our minds have infrastructure for spotting and removing bad ideas, mind parasites. But of course, they don't always work very well. <laughs> um, every single one of us has an imperfectly functioning mental immune system, which is to say some bad ideas creep in, and sometimes we screen good ideas or good information out. And it turns out that the mind's immune system actually behaves very much like the body's immune system does. So um, there's some research going back to the 1950s that says that, I'm going to run this by you slowly here. (laughs) If you expose a mind to a weakened form of an argument and then belittle it, belittle the argument, the weakened version of it, the mind will often become resistant even to good versions of the same argument. Mm. So in the same way that you can prime the body's immune system to become more vigilant against microbes, you can prime the mind's immune system to be over vigilant against certain good arguments. Could could you give an example of that? Yeah, well, so when Donald Trump presents progressive ideas and derides them, mm. So when people with a humane approach to immigration say we need to treat, we we have to stop separating families and their children, migrant families and their children at the border, Donald Trump would go on TV and belittle them for for weakening America and and, uh, letting rapists into our country. And those emotional appeals were simply insensitive to what people were actually saying. And basically... There was almost a Machiavellian genius in the way that they he manipulated his own supporters' minds to dismiss the arguments of progressives on immigration. Yeah, so that 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 sort of uh, weak again that r- weak approach uh, or an approach to the the weaker side and certainly not the central argument in uh, treating people humanely uh, ended up creating sort of a groundswell of we have to stop all immigrants. Period. Right? That's right, and we're seeing that play out in in scary new forms in terms of the sort of the neo Trumpian wing of the Republican Party right now, which is actually using xenophobia and I mean, I mean these, the the playbook goes back centuries, right? Um, you blame invading aliens for all uh, you scapegoat immigrants, and you gain power by manipulating the minds of fearful. Your, your own followers. <laughs> yeah. And it turns out that the techniques that work there are precisely are manipulative of mental immune systems. They, they actually hijack mental immune systems so that they react to the wrong things. Mm-hmm. And this new science, mental immunity, can help us learn how to stop doing that. The idea, too, that I find fascinating with this is this concept that even good arguments is from what you're telling us can be kind of pushed away if you are taking and building up this immune system in the wrong fashion, right? And and, that's exactly right. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, I I think you'll see the the relevant similarity here. I I grew up in a family that practically worshipped Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. And when I found out years later that he had been unfaithful to us, I come across information that he was unfaithful to his wife. And I immediately assumed that that was a lie spread by J. Edgar Hoover to <laughs> smear him. Yeah. In yeah. fact, my mind manufactured that reason to reject what turned out to be true information, to protect something I felt was sacred, uh, my image of Martin Luther King as a moral exemplar. Mm. Yeah. So, so, so when you 
start to feel that certain things are sacred or start to cherish them deeply, you become highly defensive when somebody challenges those ideas or those beliefs. Andy, does that does that play into our self-identity then? Is so this idea that we're holding this person up as an exemplar and that's about who I want to be. And if that person is no longer that exemplar, then it actually reflects poorly on me for actually choosing that person. So it is even more so than just that person being the exemplar that touches on my own self-identity. I think that's remarkably insightful. Yes. So so there's a Yale psychologist named Dan Cahan mm-hmm. who's, who's um, identified this phenomenon he calls identity protective cognition. Yep. Fancy word, right? F- fancy academics word, but he's basically saying that your own your thought processes can become really defensive of your identity. So, so when you feel like your identity is threatened by the political agenda on the, on the other side, your mind will often react as to information from the other side as if it's a threat, as if it's an micro, infectious microbe. Mm. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Right? And, and, and a lot of times our minds overreact to perceived threats rather than react correctly to you know, real falsehood or real disinformation. Which again, if you look at what's going on in the population today, you can see many, uh, you go out to YouTube and you can, you know, see the school board meetings that are going on and you can see the pure anger and reaction to what, you know, you go, it's mask mandates or just having masks Mm -hmm. in school. Mm -hmm. And you kind of go, the level of vertitude that's going on there to what is being asked seems a little bit overboard. And that feels like what you're just talking about. It it feels like things are spiraling out of control, right? With Mm -hmm. partisanship escalating on all sides. What's actually happening there is that you've got partisans on both sides just triggering more and more uh, dramatic mental immune reactions Mm. from the other side. So um, it turns out that part of mental immune health is learning to calm your mind and say, you know what, you know what, this guy's questions aren't a threat to me. Let's examine them. Maybe I can learn from them. Mm. So, so when, when a challenging question or argument comes along and you find yourself getting defensive, you feel yourself getting angry, that's a good time to just say, hang on, it's just information. <laughs> mm. Maybe I can learn from it. In fact, it might even be information I can learn from because your own you can be your own worst enemy by overreacting to stuff that threatens your identity. This is a good place to get back to the steps. We toward, have been talking about the framework. Uh, l- let's talk about the steps that we can, that we can take to um, immunize ourselves better. Yeah. So the first thing to understand is that doubts are the antibodies of the mind. And when information that feels threatening comes along, doubts will swarm to it and try to neutralize it. But you don't want those doubts or antibodies to swarm and attack and neutralize the wrong things. You, they, you need to react. You need to question the things that are genuinely objectively questionable <laughs> and not question things that really aren't questionable. And well, that's pretty easy to, to decide between the two. So that's really not an <laughs> issue for us. <laughs> right. But, 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 um, so, so, Practical lesson number one, listen to your doubts. They're trying to tell you something. A lot of times there's a little voice in the back of your head that says, "Ah, something doesn't quite make sense here. If you listen to that little voice, a lot of times that voice will alert you to defects of the idea in question. Okay. Um, Which doesn't mean you take that little voice as, uh, as gospel. Sometimes our doubts spiral out of control and get us to overreact to things, right? And so when a flat earther says, um, uh, well, so here's, here's a joke that'll, that'll help to make, make the case. Fred the flat earther dies and goes to heaven, right? He marches into God's inner sanctum and God and says, God, I've devoted my entire life to promoting flat earth theory. I have to know, is the world flat or is it round? And God says, I'm sorry to say, Fred, but the world is very, very round. And Fred's face registers shock and then recognition. And he says, this conspiracy goes higher than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> right? 
there's insight about the mind's immune system in that oh, joke. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah, quite a bit. Right? Regrettably, it's, it, <laughs> it illuminates all too much. Yes. Uh, what else can we do? Let, let's uh, let's keep going on the steps. These are yeah. So, terrific. well, this is a, a neighboring point, but remember that challenges aren't threats; they're opportunities. You, you know how they say effective people treat problems as opportunities mm-hmm. or challenges as opportunities. The same goes for verbal challenges. There, are, each and every one of them is a learning opportunity. And if you can fight down the defensiveness that says that's a threat, and say right, I'm going to engage with this challenger. Maybe that objection can actually help me to refine my worldview somewhat. You won't overreact the same way, and you'll probably learn something. Mm. Like Every time your own beliefs clash, there's a learning opportunity. Every time your beliefs and your feelings clash, or your beliefs and your desires clash, there's a learning opportunity. Every time your ideas and somebody else's ideas clash, there's a learning opportunity. And if we can all approach these learning opportunities with a collaborative mindset, it's like, hey, let's learn from each other. Let's figure, let's find out. Yeah. Instead of saying, how do I defeat you? If I instead say, that's very interesting. Let's see if we can explore it and find out together who's right. Fantastic. It reminds me, we and we've talked about this many times on the show, we've had Annie Duke on a, a number of times and she mm-hmm. has um, does a lot of work on how we think and decision-making and various different pieces. And part of the idea that she holds forth to make better decisions is that we tend to put things into black and white boxes that it's a hundred percent true or 0% false. And she yes. said, yeah, really we should be thinking about things more in probabilities that, mm-hmm. all right, I have a strong belief. It might be 99.9%. Right. Mm -hmm. But at least Mm -hmm. there's that element that, again, goes back to your element of doubt and some of the other pieces. Then instead of having when you have challenged information, what you're doing is you're reassessing the probability as opposed to looking at this as being fully true or fully not. It's all right. So ninety nine point nine. Now it's ninety seven percent now. But I still have a strong lead belief. But it's and then I don't react in that same manner. I actually think that's a really nice connection to make, right? So Annie's done some really neat work on how learning to work with probabilities can improve your judgment. Yes. And and, and so here, so here's the thing, right? On a complex political issue like immigration, there are literally dozens and dozens of different concerns on both sides of the argument. And if you're going to be truly open-minded and try to learn from all of that complexity, you're going to acknowledge some truths that actually push the needle the way you don't want it to go, mm. right? Um, it, the needle in terms of immigration policy. Say, yes. Right? So, but if you take, you know, building that wall as an all or nothing thing, if, if you take the immigrant, take a black and white mindset to the immigration issue, you're, you're basically going to a relevant consideration for loosening up our immigration laws. Mm-hmm. You'll evaluate it as, does it push the needle all the way from um, build that wall to, I don't know, maybe some compassion is warranted or, or you know, let's be, let's be more compassionate. A- any given consideration is not likely to push it all the way. Uh, so if you're expecting it to, and it doesn't, you'll just brush it off and say, well, that's not relevant. But instead you say, well, maybe it should push the needle eight percentage points in that direction. Turns out the best People with the best predictive capacities use this thing called Bayesian updating. It's basically just adjusting your prob, nudging your probabilities up or down every time a relevant consideration comes along. And by relevant, I mean truly reliable and factual. And and factual. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, it, it, talk about that for just a minute. That that's a a great uh, segue into the way that we can think about this stuff. The, the Bayesian updating kind of thing. Yeah. So I'm no expert on the the mathematics of this, but but there's a there was a 17th century, 18th century cleric who discovered that uh, there's a relatively simple mathematical formula for how you should adjust your estimation of the probabilities given new information. Mm-hmm. And basically he was saying, if you there's a mathematically correct way to do that, and it involves adjusting the probabilities up or down, not all the way to one or zero, <laughs> right? but nudging it from 93 to 97% certain, or from 97 back to 82% certain. And you don't actually have to understand the math or do the math. All you need to know is that you shouldn't overreact and treat everything as black and white, 
You just need to kind of allow the new information to complexify your worldview, mm -hmm. add nuance and richness to it, and also nudge your probabilities one way or the other. Do you see that? So one of the things that, and maybe I'm projecting my own ideas out here or, or having a limited set of, of things to look at, but one of the issues that I think I see in today's world is that when that happens, so for instance, if I have information that comes in and it shifts my perspective from 99% down to even 90%, what I see many people doing is going, well, it didn't take it down to zero. So therefore I can, I don't have to even take it into consideration and I still can hold my, my viewpoint at this. And then information a week from now comes in and they're starting at 99 as opposed to 90. And so it doesn't actually build upon each other because they're taking each as a distinctive. And then if it doesn't get me all the way down, it doesn't yes. have the impact. It, it, am I off I, on I that? Think Idea. I think you, you 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 said that very well. That that matches my mental model of how these things work very very well. Yeah, and I think so. Culture wars kind of exacerbate this, right? Mm. If you feel as though acknowledging any truth at all to what the people on the other side of the culture war are saying, it just weakens your side's position. Mm. Then you're li likely to take an uncompromising approach to just basically sorting out basic simple things. That I mean, look. Uh, citizens of a democratic society have to be able to work through their differences. If we want to be a free society, we need to do that in ways where we allow each other's reasons to persuade us, because otherwise we're going to end up using coercion to coerce each other. And that's not <laughs> that, that doesn't move us in the direction of freedom. So if you value freedom, welcome persuasive considerations as a humane way of of modifying each other's um, <laughs> behaviors. That's that's really well said. That, that's uh, that is is good advice for us today uh, in the world that we're living in. So what, let me tack one more thing there, Tim. I don't, don't mean to cut you off, but no, please. If you want other people to be persuadable to uh, for your best reasons, then you have to be persuadable for their best reasons. It's the it's simple. The golden rule of argumentation is that if I need to be just as persuadable to your reasons as I want you to be to my reason. Which is scary for many people, right? Because yeah. again, going back to identity, going back to these different pieces, and yes, I want you to change, but I don't want to be changed in whatever conversation that we're having. You know, I, I tell a story in the book that I think can help people with this. So when I was a young professor, I, you know, I marched into the classroom and started lecturing, uh, dispensing all the wisdom I thought I had in the class. And the, my, my course evaluations were just terrible. Right? Just <laughs> terrible. And then I, I was kind of really starting to think that I'd just blown it by choosing teaching as a career, but I needed a new approach. So I, I went into the classroom the following semester, and instead I just said, I don't know, what do you guys think? Mm. <laughs> and instead of being the sage on the stage, I just became the facilitator of a collaborative approach to finding out. And that, first of all, just sent my course evaluation skyrocketing. I, I became Bravo. <laughs> I mean, students love it when they act when their points of view get taken seriously and listened to and when they understand that their observations actually do have are relevant to sorting through philosophical questions, for example. And when you create an environment where everybody is really listening to one another and learning from one another, it it can just totally change your outlook. And here's the thing I found every day for about 10 years, I would go into the classroom and put my core philosophical convictions on the line. Every day, I let my students change the way I thought about stuff. Wow. And I found out, hey, this doesn't leave me rootless. This actually <laughs> makes me more grounded. I'm actually happier. I'm, I, I, un I understand a little more. I'm a little bit less foolish than I was yesterday. <laughs> This is good stuff. And, and you know what? What it initially felt like if I let go of my core philosophical convictions that I would f end up in free fall. Mm -hmm. Turned out that wasn't true. It turns out that if I found my community of people who enjoyed exploring these ideas, it was okay. It was good. It was, I, I felt completely grounded and much more secure afterwards. And I think everybody can do the same thing if they approach it in the right spirit.
I'm so glad to hear you say that because that is really reaffirming that we don't just have to, that, that grounding ourselves in, in a particular idea isn't like concrete. It doesn't have to be. And yet, and, and yet you do make an argument in the book that there is a difference. There is an objective difference between a good idea and a bad idea. Uh, maybe you could talk about that for just a bit. So when we, so a, a common reaction these days to the idea that you know, we need to do a better job of screening out bad ideas. A common response is, well, who's to say which ideas are good and which mm -hmm. ideas are bad? Right, right. And that response reflects a conviction that the goodness or badness of ideas is fundamentally subjective, that it's fundamentally just a matter of arbitrary opinion. When you bring that attitude to philosophical inquiry, the inquiry goes nowhere. Mm. Um, you, you basically can't even get to square one on exploring deep issues and deepening your understanding. If you bring that, oh, it's all just subjective, so who cares? You know, who's to say? That attitude is just is just um, utterly corrosive of what I call value inquiry, inquiry into right and wrong, and inquiry that attempts to deepen our moral character. So you have to replace it with the idea that you know what, there really are better and worse ideas out there in some objective sense. Just even for practical purposes, adopting the idea that ideas are, can be objectively better and worse. And by, by objectively better or worse, I mean objectively true or false and objectively more conducive to our joint flourishing or not. <laughs> or yes. So can you give us an example of that? Sure. So I think that the core ideas of white supremacy, the white supremacist ideology, are profoundly antithetical to human flourishing. Mm. They might feel affirming to people who need to denigrate others to feel superior or to feel their own worth. To, I mean, I think a lot of people gravitate to white supremacist ideas and grasp onto them because they feel like a life raft. They, they feel like they're, va they're validating in some way. But it's just objectively the case that ideas like that divide humanity against itself, dehumanize some or diminish the, the worth of some and create divisions that are going to end up harming us all. Um, and, and I would argue that your typical white supremacist who may gain some temporary sense of superiority from his or her views is actually subverting their own mind mm. by embracing such ideas. They're harming themselves quite directly, whether or not it leads to societal conflict and the dissolution of our nation. Do you have to agree on some ground rule measures of that truth that you said that the idea that you know to, to help flourish or create a flourishing you know world for everyone um i paraphrase that i apologize you said it much no. more eloquently than i did um, no, you got it. but you got but it. if if i don't agree with that premise that i don't care about everyone i only care about me do, does there have to be that agreement to begin with or are there pieces of this that you can take and without that still get to this element of that there's an objective, um, better or worse idea here? Yeah. So, I mean, this question mirrors a question philosophers have, have wrestled with from- <laughs> Yeah, just, just an easy question for you, yes, Andy. No, no, big deal. Deal. <laughs> no big deal there. Just, hey, you're a, great, you're a deep thinker, Kurt. You can't help- Coffee, coffee or tea, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm um, sorry to interrupt. Well, so, the task of arguing with somebody who cares only about themselves and the task of arguing with somebody who fundamentally does care about other people are, are, deep, are d deeply different. Mm -hmm. You need to bring very different um, sensibilities and argumentative strategies to those two cases. I mean, you can imagine somebody who's just so dead set selfish or so, um, what's the word, egotist, ego... Centric? Maybe. Egocentric, thank you. That's the word I'm looking for. So egocentric that nothing you could say would ever make them care or about anybody else. I can think of a real world example, but I don't, don't, don't need to go there right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're following. <laughs> yeah. it, it may be pointless to try. To, I mean, I, I've met college students who are kind of wavering on the brink of of a kind of libertarianism that is fundamentally say, it's okay for me to care, to be perfectly selfish. So, so think about um, 
supporters of Ayn Rand or people mm -hmm. who thrilled to her Atlas Shrugged nonsense, a lot of them accept the idea that everything will work out great if we're all just selfish, if yeah. we all pursue selfishness. That turns out to be a profoundly myopic and dysfunctional ethic. Um, and you can actually reach some of the college students who are flirting with this Ayn Randian, misanthropic, you know, uh, empathy challenged worldview. You can reach them at that stage. But then there are people who are in their 60s or 70s and are so deeply set and are so, whose entire worlds have collapsed in to the point where all they care about is themselves. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not going to waste a lot of time trying to convince the latter, but I think okay. that we can do a lot to nudge people in the direction of genuine compassion for others, especially when they're younger. I've heard this advice from somewhere when I was younger, and I've actually taken it to heart and used it in, in some instances that the idea of Tim will know probably the, the person I'm talking about. I've had conversations with a friend, good friend, and we have different perspectives on, on many different ideas out there. Some of them religious, some of them others, various different aspects. And he likes to, he likes to argue. I don't, I'm not that kind of person. And so I, I like to have conversations. And so yeah. at, at many points I will ask at the beginning of this, as we're starting to get into something and it gets a little heated, you know, what would it take to change your mind? And there are times where he says, you won't. And I go, well, then why are we having this conversation? Because it's only you're getting pleasure out of it, but I'm not. And so I'm just going to, <laughs> yeah. if I can't change your mind, then why were we even having a, a, a debate about it? So a couple lovely things about that. Now, number one is the question, what would change your mind is, is a wonderful way to kind of clarify what, where the goal line is mm -hmm. <laughs> like for, for your own argumentation. Um, but it also gets people to think about whether they're really bringing an open mindset to the exchange. In the book, I argue that there's a uh, so think, think about religious apologetics. Some mm -hmm. people fall in with a certain religion and basically want to argue for the truth of that religion while maintaining an utterly unshakable faith that they're right. Mm -hmm. I argue in the book that that's, there's a deep hypocrisy in that. If you're going to engage in argumentation, you're basically pretending to, you're hoping to persuade the other, but not allowing the other person any chance to persuade you. I'm sorry, dialogue goes both ways. If, if, if you're going to try to use dialogue or argumentation to persuade others, you have to allow other people the same opportunity to persuade you. And anything less is, is a kind of hypocrisy that I think is fundamentally corrosive of the kind of dialogue that keeps us in community. With one another. I, I couldn't agree more. I've and I, I loved your section. I love when you talk about um, about that particular topic. The whole apologetics thing has always been an issue uh, for for me. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I I have friends who were very happy to say that they they majored in apologetics, that their their faith was so strong, and yet they wanted to really deeply understand it, and so they really took a lot of time. It's like I don't. That just doesn't make any sense to me. But <laughs> and I think that the idea that it's a virtue to have faith in the sense of closed-minded, ten tenaciously gripping to, uh, to a belief, the whole idea that that's a good thing, I think, corrupts a lot of mental immune systems. Yeah. But it's not just religious apologetics. It's not just um, dogmatic faith that corrupts mental immune systems. We also have political ideologies and culture wars and ideas about it's all being subjective, like philosophers call that relativism. All of these things, I, I argue, damage and corrupt mental immune systems, rendering people basically wide open to mind infections. And we need to understand that scientifically and bring that scientific understanding to bear on the problem. So if we are in this epidemic environment that uh, with, with this kind of uh, trouble, unreason, misinformation, is there a way that we could reach herd immunity? Is there a way <laughs> that we could, you know, uh, against this cultural contagion? We seem an awful long way from that. In, um, herd immunity to cognitive contagion is is a. Um, I know most of the people I know are despairing of the very possibility that we might reach herd immunity to cognitive contagion. In the book, I offer a more hopeful assessment. Um, so I think it helps to imagine a world, maybe a generation or two down the line, 
where we've gotten so good at inoculating people's minds against against infectious nonsense that outbreaks of the culture wars just don't break out anymore. Or if they do, they're kind of small things that are relatively easily contained because humanity has learned, actually learned how to dialogue in a fruitful manner. Imagine that world, right? Allow yourself to imagine how profoundly we could change the human condition wow. if we manage to inoculate our minds against nonsense the same way we've managed to inoculate our bodies against smallpox. Hmm. You talked at the very beginning of this about critical thinking and teaching that at college level course. Do you think that we do a good job? Because I think there's a fair amount of people in the United States across the globe. It's a huge amount of people who never get to go to higher education. And so how do we instill some of these inoculation elements or critical thinking skills at an earlier age? And should that be part of more of a elementary to a high school curriculum pieces of there? And how do you, how do you do the, go about that? Yeah. So I, I think elementary school teachers should be teaching collaborative inquiry, right? Oh. So don't just gather the kids around the story rug and read them stories, read them a story and then ask them questions and explore the, the ethical issues that arise in the story. Get an eight-year-old going on the question of whether whether little Johnny was fair to little Susie when he you know took her kickball kids can actually think you can by providing them a space where they can explore those questions you're basically strengthening their minds immune systems and we need to be doing that from the time kids are like 5 or 6 and not wait to teach critical thinking to until college it's too little too late to you know, tack on a little critical thinking instruction on top of 20 years of rote, 18 years of rote learning. Mm. And I want to follow that up because while we might have some teachers that are in, in listening audience, I know we have a lot of parents. So as a parent, what can I do to help inoculate my child so that they grow up having uh, an immune system, a cognitive immune system that is fully functioning and allows them to not be uh, persuaded by stupid reasons. <laughs> so I, I'm going to share with you a, a project that I think speaks to this. Um, it's controversial even within my own family because my my wife has some um, a softness in her heart for, for things like the tooth fairy and the Easter bunny story. Whereas okay. I have concerns that teaching your kids those stories and only letting them in on the secret years later is actually a missed opportunity to start strengthening the mind's immune system young. So when I was on the Joe Rogan podcast uh, a couple months ago, I made a reference to the tooth fairy, but I had a slip of the tongue and I mentioned the truth fairy. Oh, (laughs) And and Joe goes, hey, wait a second, somebody ought to write a kid's book about the truth fairy. And I'm like, you know what? I think I will. And I since have. Uh, I'm still looking for for a publisher. But here's the basic story, right? A little girl – has a loose tooth. And one of her friends says, yeah, stick it under your pillow and the tooth fairy will come and leave you a dollar. And the other friend said, nah, the tooth fairy isn't real. It's just pretend. So she goes to her kind of wise grandfather and the grandfather says, I don't know. What do you think, Sophie? And the grandfather basically encourages her to to listen to the little voice in her own head that says, "Eh, that doesn't quite make sense to me. Mm. And then they decide to give that little voice a name, the tooth fairy. And it turns out that the grandfather teaches the little girl to have conversations with the truth fairy and thereby learn to, she's basically learning to listen to her doubts, right? Learning to mm. strengthen her mind's immune system in that way. And, the, and at the very end of the story, Sophie says, wait a second, grandpa, is, is the truth fairy real? Oh, <laughs> I, I love that you've used the name Sophie or Sophia, the Greek word for wisdom. That's awfully clever of you, Andy. You got it. You're picking that. right up on it. Thank I you, Tim. Like, glad, you, glad you noticed that. If, if any of your listeners out there uh, publish kids' books, I hope they'll uh, yes. reach out to me. Yes. Oh, man. we You know, the trouble is we've got two more pages of questions and we don't have two more pages of time. Uh, so we have to we have to ask you what's on your playlist these days. 
Ah, my playlist. Yes, it goes get to the important things. <laughs> as, as Tim would say, that is the most important question. That's of why we're any here. interview we do. I don't get it. I think that would be a bad idea, and he needs to be inoculated against that. But we'll we'll work on that later. There's a whole bunch of inoculations that Tim needs that I think we have just identified with the show. So we'll go on that in a whole different port. And I'm not well, an anti-vaxxer, I... so. <laughs> <laughs> Anti-cognitive immunity vaxxer. Yeah, there, right. there we go. That's right. Um, so what's on my playlist? I've been really getting into Mark Knopfler's um, post-Dire Straits stuff. He, he's an uh, extraordinary songwriter. He has uh, an album of kind of folk tunes. I think he does all of the different instrumental parts and the vocals himself. It's called Get Lucky, and, and, and there's a song on it about... Um, it's called Piper to the End. It, it, it's about uh, a, a guy who's, he says, when, when, when I leave this world behind me to another, I will go. And if there are no pipes in heaven, I'm, go, I'm going down below. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sounds like a fantastic lyric. I love it. <laughs> um, it. It's just really heartfelt stuff, stuff that pulls at your heartstrings rather than just, you know, and I, I, I like that. And, Knopfler always makes me think and feel. And so I, I really like his stuff. Yeah. I think that's awesome. Uh, do you ever listen to music while you're working? Um, my work requires too much concentration for that. And I, so writing and such, no, I can't listen to music when I'm writing. Maybe some instrumental stuff. But um, my wife says I have attention surplus disorder. Uh, and <laughs> I, I play into that by trying to give my full attention to whatever it is I'm doing. <laughs> I love oh, it. that is fantastic. I am, uh, Tim, definitely. I think uh, you, you don't have that. So um, we'll be. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Oh, Andy, thank you. This has been informative. And as Tim said, we have two more pages of questions and notes that we could definitely go in. So at some point in the future, maybe we can have you back on uh, to talk I'd through like more that. of this because this has been absolutely informative and wonderful. Great. It's been fun for me, too. So and hang on to those notes because uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd welcome another invitation. So it's been All fun, right. guys. Thank you so much. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our discussion with Andy, have a free-flowing conversation, and talk about whatever else comes into our immunocompromised brains. Oh, we go. man. Regrettably, we are, aren't we? We are immunocompromised. We're we not... might even be infected. Oh, you know what? We might yeah. not just be not immune. I mean, have some immunocompromisation going on. I can't say that word. Why can't I say that word? How about just unhealthy <laughs> <laughs> how about that oh but it is true it is true it's so many people and and us included i think this is the big big oh. piece here is that look we aren't as immune to bad ideas as we would like to suppose that we are definitely not we need to actually practice some immunity practices to prime our bad idea immunity to start working for us and not against us. We need good mental health. We need good cognitive ways of thinking about stuff because the mental immunity is really a great analog to physical immunity, or yeah. maybe that's vice versa. But I think it's vice versa, but still, I get, I get what you're saying there. Yeah. 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 I, I liked this. I like this idea, I guess in part because I just think it's such a clever concept that the idea uh, of this this analogy, I think, just works every time. And I think that uh, Andy did a nice job of giving us some examples. But I really loved when he just gave a quick example of how do you tell when things are out of sync? A and he says, he says that every time your beliefs and your feelings clash or your beliefs and your desires clash, there's a learning opportunity. And every time your ideas and somebody else's ideas clash, there's a learning opportunity. So like if we're going to stay mentally healthy – we kind of have to stay attentive and be a little bit self-aware. And that's a good thing. It might be difficult at times. I, and I know it's difficult at times. It's difficult for me. And I can't stay vigilant 24 hours a day. However, 
there are definitely times when I sense that feeling like my beliefs and my feelings are clashing. It's like, well, wait a minute. And that's a good time to slow down and get trued up to what, you know, what's working and what's not. Yeah, that's cognitive dissonance, right? That is there this is. element of this angst that we feel when our beliefs aren't met with the information or the data that then supports them. There's a clash, as you said. And that, I think, is really key. And I love you talking about this of just slowing down because what do we typically do when cognitive dissonance comes on? You know, what are those things that we typically do? Rationalize. Yeah. <laughs> right? We rationalize just, them away. We, we ignore it. or yeah. we discount something. We ignore something. We we gloss over it. We don't often sit down, pause, and reflect upon it. And as Andy said, take it as a learning opportunity. So why? Am I feeling this way? Why do the things that you're saying make me boil over with this putrid thought of wanting to throw up when you're talking about, <laughs> oh, those are chemtrails in the in the sky and you go, right. no, no, they're not. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. And and I like that that much like other guests that we've talked to in this conspiracy theory series that Andy's not interested in challenging people on facts. It's, it's sort of the logic yeah. like, you know, that there are, there are objectively bad ideas. There are objective truths and there are subjective feelings, right? Good ideas, bad ideas actually exist. And I love when he gave the, the example of white supremacy because he went through a logical series of questions about it. He said, okay, so let's, let's just look at, at how white supremacy works and we can quickly see that from a logic perspective, it doesn't it doesn't advance the human race. It doesn't yeah. bring everybody forward, right? It's antithetical to human flourishing, I think he said. Yeah, it's I love the objectively this case that dividing humanity against itself is not a yeah. good thing. And therefore you can you can definitively say yeah. that white supremacy or any type of supremacy. It could be, you know, Chinese supremacy. It could be Asian supremacy, whatever that would be. Whoever becomes that this is, you know, white supremacy is an issue now because of the time that we live in. But you could foresee a future at some point, hundreds of years down the road, where it could be some other minority Absolutely. population or even majority population subjugating others because of their race or background. And that's a, actually an interesting piece because then you go, oh, put the shoe on, you know, put the other shoe on the other foot. Yeah. And then you can then yeah. you go, well, no, that wouldn't. That's of course, that's not right. Well, yeah, that's because it's logically doesn't fall to the truth. And I love this idea. And I think we don't do enough of looking at the logic behind many of these arguments. And particularly when we're talking with people who are holding beliefs that are bad. We don't we don't challenge their logical assumptions on yeah. this. And I just I, 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 I think that's a really important thing. Now, you know, I'm a, not a confrontational kind of person. And so it's always one of those interesting pieces. Right. Like, right. do you push this or do you not? But that's that's an interesting piece. It's always easier for me because I'm not a confrontational person either, but it is easier for me to ask questions of something that that isn't me. Like if I'm trying to convince you of something based on on because I don't believe it, then I feel like it's me against you. But if my questions are about the logic that you're using, then I get to ask myself that question at the same time. Does that yep. does the chemtrail logic hold water, so to speak? Does it, yeah. does it actually make sense? And I can ask myself and we can walk through that together rather than it being adversarial. Well, and this goes back to this idea too of black and white ideas versus thinking in probabilities. Yeah. This whole component of if I take my strongly held beliefs and those, even the ones that I'm really pretty solid on, and think about that as that's a 99.99999% chance of it being right. That's pretty high. <laughs> that's pretty dang high. Yeah. But it's still, there's that 0. 0.00001 percentage chance that it isn't. Then that becomes, a, 
it helps in having those conversations because you're moving the needle then as opposed to switching from white to black or this idea of that, you know, he, we also talked about self-identity and this idea that, you know, mm-hmm. our defenses, those those immune mental immunity defenses go up when somebody is challenging our self-identity. And that takes it away from self-identity to a certain degree. It helps us process these things. And as you said, really think through what it is that we are, are you know, asking questions about and finding logical fallacies and questioning my own logical you know, assumptions on this. So what I would like you to answer here in just one short sentence is why is it that it's so much easier for humans to default to the black and white thinking to it's all or nothing. It's either zero or a hundred. One, one sentence. That's all I get. Yeah. Well, uh, do you, are you going to need more? Um, No, but the (laughs) only way that I can answer this with one sentence is we're idiots (laughs) <laughs> period i don't know yeah, i don't know, I know why i know it's fans it's fascinating isn't it it is fascinating because it is it's you're absolutely right we we tend to fall into this element where yeah it is or it isn't it's black or yeah. it's white it's good or it's bad those subtleties of gray in between are much harder for many people to hold in our brains and and it was being facetious about being us all idiots you know i mean you and i are definitely in that idiot field but it, our oh, listeners are, yeah. are absolutely 100 percent on that yeah. brilliant side yes. of things but i think there's this element too that we probably evolved for certainty right uncertainty is it it kind of keeps us in a status right if we're uncertain then oh, it yeah. doesn't we don't stop or we don't go and that can be dangerous if we're living in a environment that that is there but i don't know it, i that's a good explanation actually but it is tough knowing that there are some things again getting back to this idea that there are objective truths and objective falsehoods there are things that are bad and things that are good but there is an awful lot that lives in this gray area in between that it's much easier for us humans to kind of ignore that mm. that that's my point mm. All right. Well, I think there are many more things we could talk about in our conversation with Andy, but he brought some really cool ideas, I think, to this whole month that we're having on conspiracy theories and bad thinking and all of that. And it's been fascinating for me to be part of this because at one point, you know, this idea that you see these conspiracy theories out there, you you look at the Facebook feeds, you look at the Twitter, you know, responses to some of the stuff and you just, it just brings me down. But, yeah, you know, talking with the, these people that we've been talking with has yeah. been a, it helps, helps me understand and it helps me say, oh, yep, you're not just idiots. There are reasons for the way that you and why you're holding these beliefs. And it's not easy to dissuade you from those beliefs. It's not easy to get you to think that the bad idea that you're holding very true to who you are and and what it means to be a person with your, you know, whatever characteristics that you have, but it is possible. And it is an opportunity for us to explore this and to make some, I don't know, take some actions against bad ideas to prepare yourself and give yourself some mental immunity so that you can go out there and be confident that these ideas are good and that you're doing the right thing. Anyway, it's given me hope. That's all I really wanted to say there in a long-winded way. That was beautifully said. And I, I would like to encourage our listeners that as we thank them and send them off for the week, that you take a little bit of hope with you as you go out and find your groove. 